I have two tips for homeschooling multiple children. Number one, deal with the highest maintenance kid first thing in the day. Um, that should keep the highest energy person calm and focused, and that sometimes helps everybody else do the same. Number two, whoever the instigator is, and moms of multiple children know that who the instigator is can change daily or even several times a day. Um, if you keep the instigator definitely within your line of sight, but sometimes also within your reach, things can go much more smoothly and you can head things off at the pass as behaviors are brewing rather than letting them, you know, fester into something that gets the whole day off the rails. Whether you have chosen to homeschool multiple children or you have had homeschooling multiple children thrust upon you, one thing you can do is have an easy hairdo. So this is my school do, no bangs, long hair, up, ready to go for the day. Another thing to know about homeschooling multiples is that the fewer number of children you have, the more discretionary time you have. So when you have only one child you're homeschooling, you have some discretionary time. When you add another to the mix, your discretionary time goes down. When you add a third to the mix, it plummets pretty rapidly. And with each subsequent child, it continues to drop. So having multiple children that you need to homeschool means that time is a very precious commodity that you don't have a lot of, so you need to use it very wisely. When I was in the thick of homeschooling five children, I had to have a schedule in order for us to get things done. Now, Whether you are homeschooling with one or far more than one, you can be assured that you are in good company. There are people um, using sunlight all across the globe who are homeschooling with one student or far more than one student. So my top tip for homeschooling with multiple students is to always be adapting and adjusting to what works best for the time. Um, over the years, that has looked different for us as we have homeschooled with uh, one, two, three, four students. Um, one of my favorite um, things to do during the Christmas break is to step back. It's a great time to evaluate uh, what you've been doing, what um, if there are any problem spots, how you might um, adjust, just little adjustments sometimes can make a big difference. Um, early on, I remember my uh, oldest student, um, he had far more academic things going on before his younger brothers. And if we needed to, in the evening sometimes, we would get out of the house and we would just pepper this in from time to time on the hard days or on days when well, you know, he requested to do this. He was definitely an extrovert. He liked to get out in the community. And so at the end of the day, whatever he hadn't finished during the day, we made something fun out of it and went um, to our local Chick-fil-A and claimed a booth. And he and I both still remember those special times of sitting together and and finishing up his reading, he would read to me um, um, for his reader, and then we would finish math or whatever. Um, and in our community, that was called the local homeschool cafeteria during the day. So we sometimes would bump into other homeschooling families. It's a great memory that I have that helped us, and it didn't feel like, oh, we didn't finish today. It was not a burden. It was just something that we did uh, when we needed to. Um, so I hope you find the strategies that work for uh, multiple students. It's always adjusting and always um, adapting and finding a little, sometimes just little adjustments that make things uh, work, work well. Hi, I had four kids talk about multiple kids and I accepted that mission, um, but I did it by scheduling. So when I had all four kids during school or even just the top three kids, I would schedule one of my oldest kids to play with the youngest while I worked with the other two. They may or may not be in the same subject, but handling two, maybe doing their reading and one doing their math was a lot easier than having four kids asking me five different things because one will never just need one thing. So my advice to you with multiple kids is just to go ahead and kind of chart out your day and schedule some time, some special bonding time with the older kids, with the youngest ones to help them read a book, 
play blocks, um, take a break, a mental break for those older ones, and just be able to get that work done. My advice for homeschooling more than one child is to look at your situation and see what approach might work best. In our house, I have two children and they're five years apart, so I've never combined them in a sunlight program and it's always been easiest for me to go back and forth between the kids. When my oldest was ready to start school, my youngest was a baby, so we used baby carriers and baby gates to keep him in the room with us while she was learning. Then by the time he was ready to start school, she already knew how to read and write, so she could do work independently while I worked with him. So that's our approach now is that they do their independent work and I just go back and forth between them. If you're a parent to littles, I assure you that it does get easier the older they get. Your youngest child is always either going to demand or require more attention because they don't have the skills to be independent yet. But as they get older and their independence increases, you'll find it getting much easier. We have three kids. Uh, and when we first started homeschooling, they were five, three, and a baby. We started with the kindergarten program. And when we had read aloud time, we would all sit in the living room and read together. Uh, the middle child would play quietly on the floor with puzzles or Legos, which aren't that quiet, but you know what I mean. And the baby would just hang out. And then when it was time to work at the table, we would all move to the table. As the baby got older, she would sit in her high chair. The middle child, I would find age appropriate activities for him to do at the table, such as tracing, dot to dot, uh, letter recognition, matching games, things that would be age appropriate. So preschool kinds of things. Sunlight now has a preschool program, but when I first started, there wasn't one. So I had to come up with my own activities. And then each year as we moved up, they just continued following along. So we would do our read alouds together. And when it was math time, we all sat at the table and did math. They each had their own program, but I would just rotate between the three kids. So teaching multiple ch children is just like feeding multiple children. Like, you know, you just, you just do it. You just figure out how to take turns, how to wait patiently while mom is working with one, with one child. Really a lot of homeschooling is, is actually character development both the moms and the child children, but I have taught a couple of children with two HPLs, LAs, science and math. And the thing that I found worked best for us in developing a routine of using more than one HPL with sunlight was to take turns working with each child. And for me, that was working with you know, each child because I only had two, but this can also work when working with multiples because you will have children grouped and using the HBLs. And so you will work with them and take turns with whoever's working with each HBL. And the thing that I really liked about this routine was that it gave the kids little breaks that they enjoyed and needed throughout the day where they could work independently on something else for school if they were super motivated, or they could work independently with some sort of activity, uh, playing craft, you know, whatever they could do on their own and develop some interests outside of just doing stuff with me. Um, so I think the key to taking the turns is that you do have to develop uh, some consistent rules. And basically ours was that you um, work independently while mom is working with the other student. And of course, if there's an emergency, you can interrupt it, but, but yeah, that really doesn't happen too often. And so developing that uh, consistency with the routine really helped uh, make using two levels of sunlight uh, just go smoothly throughout the day. When I was homeschooling both of my daughters, one of the things that helped me manage that process was to manage my own expectations. It was unrealistic for me to think that while I was working with my older daughter, my younger daughter was never going to interrupt us. So to set myself up for success, I just accepted the fact that I had two children and at any given moment, they could both need me at the same time. So while we tried to minimize interruptions while we were working with the sister, the other sister did interrupt and I tried my sister best did to be gracious to train, to wait and be patient, but to deal with what needed to be dealt with. So my advice for homeschooling multiple children is to expect that you're going to be interrupted. And then if you don't, it's a great day.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this month's Homeschool Helps and Hacks. It's our Multiple Kids Challenge Accepted session, and I'm excited to be joined today by Jen and Amber um, as we talk about this. This is one of the biggest topics or the most questions we get from Sunlighters and prospective Sunlighters. So we're excited to answer those for you today. Um, if you made it right on time and saw the video, you saw that I have two Sunlight kids. Jen and Amber have even more than I do, so they can get strategies with more uh, children than that as well. So I'm excited to talk to them. Um, if you're joining us live, tell us where you're from. It's always fun for us to see. We've got people joining us from all over the United States as well as outside the country. So we'd love to see that in the chat. Also, if you have questions, drop them there. Lisa, Sheila, and Jonna are gonna help us out in case we don't get to your questions. But that said, we're gonna switch up the format a little bit this time around. If you're familiar with our helps and hacks, we generally answer questions one at a time, but then that means we don't get to all the questions. So I'm going to give these ladies a whole group of questions that kind of go along with the same topic. And then we'll try to answer multiple questions at once. That way we can get to more of your questions. But if we say something that spurs on something, please drop that in the chat because we would love to answer that for you. So let's start with some introductions. Jen, I've got you on the top. So I would love for you to tell us, you know, about you and maybe share with us what the most challenging multiple kids homeschool season was for you and briefly share with us how you managed that, whether that was combining kids, choosing one program, you know, what did you do to handle all those kids in that season? Sure. Um, can you see me and hear me, Sunny? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm having some tech issues, so I cannot see anything, but I can hear you. So I think we're good. <laughs> I'm Jen. Um, I'm the homeschool mom of four kids. Um, three are done homeschooling at this point, and one is still in eighth grade. Um, so I've been at it for a little more than 20 years. Um, my biggest challenge was the year that I had all four of them actively homeschooling at once. So I had a high schooler, a middle schooler, an elementary schooler and then a kindergartner and or maybe first grader it was a never ending affair i we just went and then we kept going and i it was so overwhelming like i can't even find the words it was so overwhelming but we did it and um we learned a lot and they helped each other and we had some really great experiences but but definitely trying to homeschool, multiple kids doing all separate things is a huge, huge undertaking. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine all the different age groups that you were trying to teach at that time too, because that does make it harder to combine. Amber, why don't you tell us about your biggest challenge that way with your kids and what you did? Okay. Um, first, what I, I just would love to point out that we all have maps in the background because what is up with that? <laughs> <laughs> homeschool mom, <laughs> the homeschool life. That's exactly right. Um, I have a, kind of a, a wide gap. I have 12 years between my oldest and youngest. So I have been homeschooling since my oldest, who is 24, was in preschool. So like Jen, I've been at it for uh, 20 years. Um, and I think maybe one of my most challenging times was uh, having my fifth child and then moving within two weeks and having to live with my parents and mm -hmm. thinking that I was going to be in a new house. Uh, but I wasn't because we couldn't find a place to live and I hadn't packed the, all the school. You, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just, I'm just sorry, but multiples. Yes. Is really, um, un hard. And then you add into it, like we can't find all of our curriculum and whoops, I didn't pack enough clothes and it was it was tough um so that's the kind of i don't know i just feel like when you have multiple kids there's just a zoo happening all the time right and so i loved what lisa said just before we came up where became before we went live where she was talking about managing expectations because i feel like for me um okay we can talk about scheduling and we can talk about all this stuff but part of it is a mental game where you say this is my life and this is my choice and we're going to accept it and and do our best by God's grace, right? Um, and and with multiples, there's always a challenge. I had another really tough season, but we can talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. What I love 
love about it though is despite those tough seasons you worked through them and yes. kept going and so it is possible um and i absolutely agree expectations are a large part of that and i know every year my expectations kind of change depending on where my kids are at um let's jump right into the time management section amber in your video you talked about the more kids mm -hmm. you have the less discretionary time you have yeah. and if you're choosing to homeschool even if you only have one child you have less time than the average parent um, because now you've taken on that educational role as well. Right. So we've got questions. Carmen asked, how do you get it all done without school taking all day? Uh, Dance Heart So 7 in the app is asking about scheduling and being behind. Marcella is saying she's schooling three or more students, but trying not to be too easy or too hard on some students. She wants to make sure they're all academically successful, even though they're combining some curriculum. Emily is looking for practical solutions to helping the kids with their different table subjects. So we refer to table subjects as the things you do at a table, like math, um, language arts, they're more skill-based. Uh, Rachel is asking how to juggle three or more sunlight programs. She's looking to the future and she doesn't want to neglect her older kids academically or miss out on the baby snuggles with the younger kids. And then Josada is saying, how do I take care of my home and cooking and chores as well as homeschooling three children, she feels she can do one well, but not the other. So either school's going great and the house is falling apart or it's the opposite. So in answering all of those questions, what's your advice for the scheduling pieces, making sure no one's falling behind and that you're still able to do your regular life things as well? Man, that, she's given uh, us a test here, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, okay. You, you so say you parent, you've love... homeschooled multiples. Let me put you to the test. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love everything Amber already said, but I'll take a stab at this one. It feels like juggling. Am I right? Okay. So let's talk about juggling for a second. When you are juggling, you really are only having your hands on one or two things in a given moment. Everything else is in transition. So homeschooling multiples, trying to pull off Christmas, clean house, like you've talked to your mom this week, you have time for a conversation with your husband, your hair is washed, like the bills are paid, there's food in the refrigerator. I, I mean, the list could go on forever, but it's juggling. You don't have to go to the grocery store every day. And in fact, if you kind of plan to go once a week, then like, Sorry if it's if we're down to peanut butter and jelly, but I go to the grocery store on Friday and today's Thursday. Well, today's actually Wednesday, but you know, so like we're not going to starve. It'll be fine. Um, if we did a hard push on math yesterday and got everybody's math done, then today I'm going to make sure I read all the things. Um, you know, the house doesn't have to be clean all day, but if the house can be clean 10 minutes before dad walks in the door, that feels like it has a lot more oomph then if the house is clean at two o'clock and it's trashed again by the time he walks in the door, I mean, maybe that's just me and my family. Um, but if anybody out there can relate to that, it's juggling. You're, you're doing a little bit of a lot of things all the time. It feels a little crazy. Let me just be the first person to say that's totally normal. Yeah, I, I like, um, Jen, I, I wrote down while you were talking, I wrote down 10 minute tidy. Uh, in our, mm -hmm. in our home, we would every once in a while just stop, you know, like maybe I'll blow a whistle. Just kidding. I never mm -hmm. blew a whistle, but let's just pretend that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Hard break. We're all just going to stop and 10 yep. minutes. And I would give each child a place of the house, right? Yep. So Steph, your job is the living room. Emily, your job is the dining room. Josiah, your job is the hallway and the stairs. And Ben, just sit there and look cute. What, Whatever, you yep. know, depending on the age. And um, I set the timer for 10 minutes. So nobody felt like they were going to do it forever. And we we use this phrase, make it look like a hotel. So that's mm -hmm. what you just make your area look like a hotel. So every once, and of course that, that wasn't constant, but I'm just saying that's one way of saying, oh my word, everything is going everywhere. Okay, here's the deal. With multiple children, just like uh, with school having a schedule and you don't have the discretionary time, with multiple children, you don't have also discretionary space or anything else. So you do have to be more careful about how much yeah. clutter you allow into your home 
Amen. You have to be more conscious of having a place for everything so that when you say, okay, 10 minute tidy, there is a place for the stuff to go. Um, and it just is the way it is. And sometimes it's hard. Okay. This is, you, you know, where you fall on the spectrum. I have a hard time sometimes just accepting that this is the way life is. Like I want to have, you know, go get my nails done all the time, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't, I can't, I don't have the money because I have a ton of kids. I don't have the time because I have a ton of kids. So there are trade-offs. Does that make sense? And as far as getting through, I, I really, for me, school was from about eight to one. Mm -hmm. If it didn't happen between eight and one, the school probably was going to get whatever piece was going to get set aside. But from eight to one, that was my intentional focus. Um, we had the same thing every Monday for breakfast and every Tuesday for breakfast and every Wednesday for breakfast. So I didn't have to think. We had the same thing every Monday for lunch, every Tuesday for lunch, yep. every Wednesday for lunch. So I didn't have to think. So then once I don't have to think about breakfast and lunch, and like Jen said, shop once a week, I make sure I have that. Then that helps because that breakfast and lunch happen during school time. So school happens from eight to about one or two. And again, things change as children age. But um, then my afternoon was certain people had rest times. And then that was my time to get a jump on dinner, to um, mm -hmm. do laundry, whatever. Yep. So that's, that's a part of the piece. I mean, I just said a lot right there, but the moms who are watching with a hundred children will understand. Oh, okay. Maybe that's, that's a thought, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, amen. Everything you just said. Plus I used to tell um, my husband that he could come home. He could pick any three of the five choices in a day. He could come home to clean, happy children, educated children, a clean house, a hot meal, or a happy wife. And for me to pull off any three meant that the other two would not be done. And we could change it every day. I just, I could not do all five at once. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think, yeah, again, kind of along with those expectations, right? We have all these yeah. dreams of, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And yep. I know I'm very much a type A perfectionist, right? So I'm going to do what I set out to do. Yep. But if homeschooling has taught me anything, it's that you're working with other personalities, you're working with yep. young children it's not going to turn out exactly the way you think it is. So choosing what those top priorities are, yeah. or I love what you both said about automating things, right? Whether it's meals or chores or whatever on this day of the week, this is what we do. Um, another thing, Amber, you mentioned carving out that time for school. I think yeah. when you're homeschooling, a lot of times people don't realize how busy you actually are. And they'll say, oh, well, you're home all day. Can you pick up my child? Or can you do this okay. or that or whatever? And you have to be very intentional about saying, no, that's mm -hmm. when I'm doing school with mm -hmm. my kids, right? And schedule it in the same way you would if you were taking them to school or you were going to a job or whatever yep. the thing may be. Um, also, my kids are eight and 13 and I only make them one meal a day. They are on their own for breakfast and lunch in our house. So I think the older your kids get as they get more independent, teach them how to do those chores, teach them how to feed themselves and clean up after themselves because you don't want to spend all day trying to feed people and then teach people and do all those other things. So that's my tip there. Um, I know my hardest season was when I had like the toddler baby stage and then one that wasn't super independent. But as your kids get older, like I said in my video, they do get a lot easier because they can do a lot of things on their own. We have uh, somebody asking about like a kindergartner, two second graders, a fifth grader, a seventh grader, and a tenth grader. So she's got quite a few kids mm -hmm. spread out, um, yeah. like you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, and all kind of in different age groups too. Yep. And is asking if sunlight's a good fit. Um, because it's literature based, of course, you can combine kids into some things. Can you guys speak a little bit to that and what some options might be for combining? But then also, if your kids have a wider age span, how do you? get all of that to work? So my kids, my maximum um, age gap was 12 years, just like Amber's. The key for me was to help the older ones to learn how to be independent 
so that I didn't have to sit on top of everybody all day. I basically had to sit on top of somebody each in their turn, but not everybody all day. So if I could say to the seventh grader and the 10th grader, can, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to do school with probably the youngest first, because if you ignore those little ones, they totally make you pay for it. Um, can you go upstairs and grab boys laundry and put that in? Can you start your math so that whatever problems you're having, when I get to you, we can, we can talk about that and make sure we hit that today and then do my thing with one of them. And then when I hit the next one, be like, okay, can you play with the baby? And then you sit down the other one and do your seat work in time for me to throw a thing in the crock pot. And then as I work my way up, everybody gets an, a little bit of chores to do like on, you know, spec from mom and everybody gets enough time to do their seat work every what, what, 30 minutes or so I'm like in transition. So if you're having a problem, so if you have a question, so if you're having an issue, like I'm available to troubleshoot and I just go ping, 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 ping through them. I will say, if I could go back and do it over again, I would combine any possible thing I could possibly dream of combining. <laughs> That's good. Um, I agree with Jen. The 10th grader especially is independent at that point. Although please don't forget that even 10th graders need accountability. So mm -hmm. that, that can be a hard thing. Please don't let them think that they are beyond being checked on and that they're adults because they're not. So for me, that looks like um, I usually sit down with that high schooler and we come up with a schedule for their day. So, okay, you're going to do calculus, then physics, then this, then this. Awesome. And here's the general time frame because I, I want them, if they were going to a traditional school, they would have a, some kind of schedule. And for me, that keeps them accountable. By all means, this isn't the Bible, okay? I'm just telling you for me what, what has worked is to for them to have some sort of schedule and have some accountability. So for that older one, but that's not something that takes a ton of my time each day. But that maybe is a before school gets started for the year sort of conversation. Uh, the seventh grader down, I would, pr okay, always pre-K through sixth grade, we did the same science doesn't matter. Whoever's whoever's in sixth grade to preschool, same science. And I'm going to say for several, for not for my oldest, but for everyone after that, it was seventh grade and down. We all did science together. So however that works for your family, that is one big family solution. I would definitely combine that. And then once they hit eighth grade, they're doing science on their own or through a co-op or some other way that you can do it. But that's that's how I've managed that particular thing. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if that helps. Um, for HBLs, the kids who are, I had uh, my second and third child, we met in the middle for history um, and, you know, read alouds and all of that. My older one was pretty independent and I was able to do two levels with that. But yes, depending on what you have, she said two second graders, a fifth grader. Yeah. And seven, and then one then younger one. And then one younger than that. Yeah. I think maybe with all of them, we're combining for history or at least combining them all for um, read alouds. And Amber, do you think yeah. um, when you're managing multiple kids like we are, um, did you do like something separate for grammar and for spelling and for handwriting and for language arts and, and, and all the supplemental things every year? Or did you like adjust your expectations to, to like what we realistically have time for? Cause I ended up not doing every single possible little tiny bit every year. And then I would look at um, like the like blog posts and stuff from homeschool moms who had, fewer kids on their plate. And I, you know, kind of have a little bit of jealousy of like, oh, that would be so fun if I could do all those things. But I kind of felt like I had to adjust my expectations down. Yes, way down. And I, that, that's a good point, Jen. I was going to say when we first started, my oldest, I had a spelling curriculum that felt very um, parent intensive. 
And mm -hmm. I had to give that up fast. We found something yeah. for spelling that I was like, all right, <laughs> let's do the spelling that's, um, and, and maybe it combines with, you know, vocab or something. So something yeah. also, um, I couldn't stay on top of writing. No, I'm not talking about handwriting. I'm talking about the creative stuff. So we mm -hmm. would do some of it, but I, we certainly didn't do a ton of it. And I, I because I literally could not do it, yeah. I could not stay on top of it all. So I had to choose. That doesn't mean that every year. So, so some years we did more writing and then other years we mm -hmm. didn't because I, I couldn't keep my head above the water. And in my home. So you're. Your adult yeah. kids now, are they good writers? Are they functional? Yeah, actually they are. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. Yeah. You both yes. have adult children. Yes. Do you feel they missed anything by skipping over some of those assignments in the earlier years? No, because the, the big picture is they learned to learn mm -hmm. and they did learn to communicate. Yeah. And my, my oldest daughter, right, my guinea pig, I... Um, <laughs> could tell she was a good writer. Like anytime she wrote anything, it was like really good. And it wasn't from me. And so she thought she was going to college. Like I'm going to fail everything. You, you homeschooled me. I, I never did whatever. So then she gets to <laughs> her first writing class and the professor talks to her one day and says, you're one of my very best students out of like two or 300 freshman students. And she looks at me and said, I guess you were right. Not like that she yeah. knew how to write. Anyway, long story short, she got into um, working at the writing center at her university. So she was helping. Nice. The one thing I felt like I didn't really train her well to write a thesis and, you know, all this stuff. I just didn't. I felt like I had dropped the ball and I had CC friends who were like, my kid's been writing a thesis every year. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm a failure. And then now then she goes in her sophomore year. She's helping other students write thesis and write, helping them with their, anyway, God, God filled in all the gaps. So yeah. that's all I'm saying. And then I, even my second daughter went into a program where she didn't have to do any creative writing, the kind of writing she did, or even research writing. She was in nursing school. They had to write papers about patients and she knocked yeah. it out of the park with that because she can follow directions. Yeah, absolutely. Something you both have brought up is that tendency to compare, which I think is is true of a lot of parents anyway, but especially when you're homeschooling with a very rigorous program and you see other people out there doing everything or doing it more or what appears to be better. Um, before we jump more into answering some more questions, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, of course, we know, I think logically that comparison is a trap, but sometimes it's hard not to do that. So what is your biggest advice for, you know, that parent out there that maybe feels like they're not doing it as well or they're failing because they see someone doing what appears to be so much more in their homeschool? Uh, yeah, cut it out. Cut it's it not out. useful. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> what I mean, which is what I would tell Amber if she was like, but my neighbor's doing it so much better. Or, you know, what I would tell any one of my kids who was like, but she's prettier than I am. You know, stop. You do you. This life is hard enough to make decisions, especially parenting decisions, educational decisions, you know, the day to day teaching decisions for these kids. But these are the kids I was given. And nobody is better in the world at figuring out what they need. Nobody is more invested in my kids than I am. Nobody is more invested in the success of your children than you are. You are the perfect person to decide for them. To decide and then stop looking at what everybody else is doing. Because they're not deciding what the best thing is. They're deciding what the best thing is for their kids. Not your kids. Everybody has a different path. Do your thing. Yeah. And while, while I agree, we can learn from each other, right? Like I've gotten some yeah. really good ideas from other moms, or I think, oh, I need to reevaluate that. Or even like just now when we were talking about how to manage and I said, maybe you have the same meal every Monday for breakfast. Okay. Maybe some mom out there said, oh, okay. So that's not a comparison thing, right? That's like, oh, I never, I didn't think of doing that. So sometimes we do need input from other people and some evaluation, but the comparison thing, I agree with Jen, you, God gave you your children. Um, 
He entrusted them to you. And so now you work hard, do what's in front of your windshield, but nobody, and you know what? You're not in anyone else's home. You don't know what's really happening. So when we talk about that comparison thing, I think we make a lot of assumptions about what's going on in each other's homes that probably isn't true at all, right? We see only what people want us to see. So that's the, but it is hard. It's hard, hard, hard. And so we need um, someone constantly preaching to us or us preaching to ourselves that no, th this is this is my path. This is what we are doing. This is what's working for our family. And we move forward. But again, not that we can't learn from each other or learn, you know, to do anything differently. But the comparison thing is not is not right. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those curriculum choices. We have several questions about either like combining their kids this year or what to do in the future. They're trying to plan ahead and, and get on top of that too. So Catherine's asking about combining children without one being behind or the other way ahead in content yeah. that's not appropriate yeah. for their level. Yeah. And uh, let's see, she says, what ages and in what ways can you have students start working independently bit by bit, kind of getting on that path? Or Katrina has stretched out her history Bible literature program over a year and a half and science over a year and a half, but she has her kids in their individual language arts levels and wants to do those one per year. So she's trying to figure out kind of the logistics of how do I stretch? How do I combine? How do I, you know, keep them moving at the right pace? Um, somebody else in the app is asking about, uh, she would love to hear what we found works for combining ages. Like she has a second grader and a kindergartner that are currently together in an HBL and a language arts. And she would like to keep them there as long as she can. But she has two younger kids, a two-year-old and a 10-month-old. So she's trying to figure out, you know, how she should combine them later and if it will correlate with what their older sisters are doing. Um, Katie's asking about if you're using more than one program. Um, so like if they don't match, so say you're doing a world history program with one or more children, and then you're doing like an American history program with other kids, mm -hmm. you know, how do you not get behind? How do you prioritize everything and make sure you're getting to everybody? So it's a lot of these questions about, you know, combining kids into a level, but if you're doing, you know, this level here and this level there, how do you make sure nobody falls behind and how do you choose those levels for them in the first place? Um, I would love um, to see, oh, you wanna go first, go. Jen? No, go ahead, Amber. Okay, um, you're never going to be behind, especially in history, okay? So with the history and the science, these, these are top, look, you are never gonna teach everything there is to know about history in pre-K through 12th grade. I don't care who you are or where you go to school. You can always learn more history. You can always learn more science, okay? That's why people get PhDs in these things because the learning never, ever, ever stops, all right? And you typically have to go to college and study to, to learn about very ancient history in depth if that's what you wanna do. So we, you're never going to learn it all. So you're not gonna be behind, okay? So I want to I want to take that off the table right away. Um, in high school, there are certain like everyone typically will have a United States history course on their high school transcript, and everyone will typically have some kind of world history on their transcript. So when you get to that point, that might be something to think about. But until then, you're not behind, you're not ahead, you're not anything. You're learning. You're learning. It's beautiful. <laughs> and um, also just because sunlight packages everything together nicely for you doesn't mean you have to be married to that. OK, so if your language arts material is following a uh, world history, but you really want to do American history. Uh, OK, it's OK. It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's language arts. It's OK. Um, that it, you're not going to you're not going to lose something sunlight designs it that way just so it's really cool when it works but it, it doesn't have to be you know if you go to traditional school they don't think about that at all you go to american right. history your american history class with mr bowser and then you go off to your literature class with miss mcgillicuddy and and the the two never even talk to each other okay so it's okay that's that's one thing i just want to hit on another thing is 
I remember, Jen, I bet you do too, when you first are on this journey and you're trying to figure out which HBL to do when, and then you're going, oh no, oh no, what will I do five years from now? Yes. When when little five-month-old Benji is six, what am I going to do? <laughs> Stop that too. It's, it's, yeah, it's exactly. going to work out. And I know that's a really nebulous answer, but I promise it's true. It's yes. just like when someone says to you, you'll know when the math curriculum isn't working anymore and you need to change. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, what are you doing? How will I know what will right. happen? And guess what? Sure enough, three years down the road, I knew I had to make a change for one of my kids with their math. Yeah. And I can't tell you how I knew. I just knew. And I was right. <laughs> because so same yeah. with the HBLs. Jen's turn. Okay. <laughs> so everything Amber just said is completely, totally correct. So do everything she just said. Also, um, here's my two cents. So for the person who said, you know, they're stretching out the HBL, but they want to do uh, one language arts every year. So do one language arts every year. You're not going to do every single assignment. You're not going to hit every single dictation or copywork. You're not going to finish every single creative expression assignment with every kid to complete total finished product every week. It's not possible. I mean, if you actually do it, please text me because I, I want to know that somebody is out there who could make that happen because I definitely could not. There will be things you skip. There will be assignments that you're like, we. this is just like something we've already done. She totally knows how to do this. We're moving on. Um, there are days you're going to be like, it is gorgeous and 85 degrees. We're not doing school. We're going to the beach. Go to the beach. That's my advice. We can do dictation again next week. Um, so don't think of it as being behind pick and choose from all the curriculum you have in that language arts, do the things you feel like are important that are realistic in the time you have with the kids you have in the house you have. If you move in the middle of the year or say six of you get flu a, and it takes two weeks to recover, you're going to skip some stuff. That is exactly what would happen in any educational setting. It is not behind. It is just reality. That's that. On the subject of training kids to be independent and how do we do that? Let me tell you my formula. Um, I My youngest is a teenager. Everybody in my house do, can do their schoolwork. The ones in college, the other ones have jobs. It's, you know, they've all turned into actual human beings. Um, so first I would leave them with a math page and be like, I'm going to go to the bathroom. When I come back, could number two please be done? And we do that until we met with generalized success. It might take a day. It might take a month. It might take three months. Then I could say things like, I'm going to stand right here, like six feet away from you and unload the dishwasher while you finish this page. If you have any questions, say them out loud and we can talk about it, but I'm not going to sit next to your body. I'm going to stand six feet away and multitask. And eventually they could do that independent, independently without you know me sitting in arm's reach. Then we could get to things like, you know, I'm going to unload groceries while I'm doing that. Get your handwriting book out and do the next page or I'm reading with your brother. I'm sitting right here. You can see me. Please just finish whatever they thing they could do while, you know, I'm reading. So obviously not a reading thing, but maybe they could do some math or some handwriting or whatever. Um, by the time we hit, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, then, you know, for my kids, your mileage may vary. That is totally okay. Everybody's family is different. Um, I could say things like, do that math and bring it to me. Do the next page and bring it to me. Do a rough draft and bring it to me. Not all in one day. Everybody needs me to sit on them for something. But, you know, we worked up to that so that by high school, I, you know, I would sit, we did a more weekly thing than Amber said she did hers daily. Um, we would do a more weekly thing. So this week, you need to finish this math, this science, this writing, this reading, whatever. And that way the kids had the freedom to kind of do their own scheduling. I had one who did like all the math one day, all the science the next day. 
not what I would have picked, but that's the point of being independent. <laughs> Long as you're getting it done, we're cool. <laughs> um, and then I had another one who would do a thing every day. So it never felt overwhelming again, totally works. As long as you're on schedule, I'm cool. Um, so that by the time you hit high school, you, you know, have these independent workers, independent learners who come to you for counseling, for coaching, for um, accountability, for discussion, but who really can work on their own. I will say in all honesty, it wasn't so much in my house that high school was a goal, but whenever the next baby was due, I needed one more person to be able to work if I fell asleep reading. You know, Jen, Jen said something else that I think is super important. She said, we worked on this and my kids were pretty independent, like able, I was able to send them in fifth, sixth or seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And I see moms posting a lot. Why is my first grader needing me so much? Because he's six. They need you so much. They're yeah. six. <laughs> yes. So the expectation that the third grader should be able to just sit and happily do all their work. That is not reality. If you have a child, a third grader who can sit and do all their work, um, that's special. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> probably not one of your remaining eight children will do that. Okay. So <laughs> if, if that's just the way in, by nature, our firstborns are a little more, uh, tend to be, and I won't say across the board, but tend to be more of a people pleasing and they they might not give you as much stink with schooling, but third grade is not, I, I wouldn't say they're not independent yet. And sometimes we get impatient with that parenting process because it's also a parenting thing, right? And a, a mom thing yeah. on top of the school thing our expectations sometimes are so high and, and it's not realistic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. I love what you mentioned about different kids do different things. I know I fell into that trap with such a big age gap between my kids where by the time my son was coming around, my daughter could do a lot of things independently. And I just assumed he would learn the same way at the same pace. And I do have a third grader now and he does a few things independently, but he yes. still is very much yes. hands on and I have to be involved. So yeah. I love Jen, what you said about start small, you know, one math problem while I run to the bathroom or, mm -hmm. you know, do this handwriting page while I'm standing right here. Um, mm -hmm. And then Amber, what you're saying too about don't expect them to be doing what a seventh grader can do when they're six years old. Yeah. You know, you do, it does take time to get to that point. Absolutely. I've seen a few questions in here too about lining up your HBLs. So like if you're doing American history with your older kids, also doing like a lower level American history with your younger kids. Um, I will tell you from personal experience, mine ended up that way, but it doesn't really, I don't find it to be an advantage. They don't line up all that well. My oldest is way more independent, so I'm not reading as much with her. So don't feel like you have to be doing like D and K and 100 together. Yeah. Um, because you really are going to be jumping around between kids and doing whatever you're doing with that group of kids at the time. And it doesn't have to be the exact same thing that you're studying because they don't really line up that well. You as the mom, you're going to see more connections between things you've taught different kids because you're retaining it probably a little better too. Mm -hmm. um, I love also what you guys said about there's no such thing behind in subjects like history or science or, I mean, I learn things all the time from sunlight, even the earliest elementary programs yes. as an adult college educated woman. So I know your yes. seven, eight year old, you know, child, they, they will learn even if they're on the old end of a program or the young, you know, wherever they're at there. Um, but let's get into some questions we have about uh, modifying for like special needs learners. Uh, Deanna is mm -hmm. asking about that. Um, you're probably not going to be able to do a full sunlight program the way it was written for one child, um, if you're making those accommodations. And then also keeping everyone entertained. If you are doing like read alouds or something as a group, uh, one mom says it seems to all fall apart as soon as the youngest gets bored. I know you guys have spoken about that. The youngest is, is usually gonna need a little more attention. Um, and even with hands-on activities to go with it, they're having a hard time keeping all the kids engaged. So what's your advice for situations like that? 
I always let my kids, uh, like today I was reading aloud and my 13 year old was drawing and I'm okay with that. He's laughing at all the right places. You know, he's like looking surprised when a surprising thing happens. So I know he's paying attention. Um, so, I mean, we've done drawing, we've done coloring, we've done Legos, we've done those sticker by number books. Um, I know for me, if I'm listening like to an audiobook, I can't also be doing something um, that involves words. So like, I can't type a message and still be listening. Somehow like the words part of my brain can only do one, but I can color or I can sticker or look at something with numbers. And so I limit my kids to those kinds of things. So like Legos are cool, but you know, reading another book, not so much. Um, that tends to keep everybody entertained. Um, the youngest one would be sitting, touching me to retain their attention a little bit more, um, give them that like physical stimulation of being, um, I don't know if it's like accountable or just feeling the attention a little bit more. I always got more mileage if the baby was not, and I mean baby, like the youngest in the room, was not like roaming, looking for something to get into, but actually glued to mom. Um, Sunny, you said something the the, is the youngest a baby? What what was that particular question? Was the youngest a toddler, um, a baby, or it doesn't specify? She just says that it falls apart as soon as the youngest gets bored. So it sounds like she's trying to read aloud with multiple kids, but the youngest is the biggest distraction. Okay, so I yeah. think depending on the age, um, I always had alone playtime with my youngest worked in. So the youngest would go to their room. Maybe I'd put a baby gate up. Um, so that I could hear what was going on and I would set a timer for 30 minutes and I would turn on a story for them and they would just play in their room um, so that they would not be as distracting and I could do whatever I needed to do to concentrate. Um, I've said this to multiple, anytime I get a chance to say it, I do read alouds during lunch. Even the youngest mm -hmm. is busy eating at that point. So I would do someone's read aloud at lunchtime and all of them would enjoy it. And it typically only takes me 15 to 20 minutes to do one read aloud, one person's read aloud. And I would often do some kind of reading during breakfast. So anytime I had a captive audience, I managed to find time to stuff food in my own mouth. That is the one question always people ask, but when did you eat? Well, I... <laughs> I ate while I prepped food. I just popped yeah. some stuff in my mouth. Yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to wither away. And also, um, yeah. you know, when I was cleaning up, I would scrape some mac and cheese out of the bottom of the pan and have a couple mouthfuls. And maybe that was it for that day, but or at least for that minute. But um, using nap time, depending on the age, using nap time and things like that, um, I, I found that to be super helpful. And I know we don't have time to go into all the minutia, but those are two tricks I have. Um, and as far as the special needs um, portion of it, I do not have a lot of experience with that, but I would say don't, don't feel like you have to do everything. You, you are going to need to figure out what the language arts looks like for your person um, I think reading aloud, no matter what, is really valuable for children wherever they are on any yeah. kind of spectrum. Um, and so I think that piece can just be really helpful and life-giving no matter what. Um, and again, there's different ways of accomplishing that too. So I know we have other places that, that have spoken to this particular need. Right, Sunny? Yeah, yeah, we do have some blog posts about that. Uh, something that I just thought of though, whether your child has special needs or not, is that the guide is just a guide and it is full. I mean, it is designed for, 
the most advanced student you could think of and making sure they have enough to do. But if you don't do the entire thing, you're still providing a very solid education to your yes. kids. Um, and I think also looking at it as, I mean, you can cut out whole books if you want, or we talked yes. a little bit about writing assignments. My approach generally is I'm going to try this with this child, but I'm not afraid mm -hmm. to drop it if it's not working mm -hmm. or slow it down. I mean, I definitely moved a little too quickly through some of the lower elementary for my second child because I had it. It worked first time around. I thought, you know, oh, it's going to work great again. And I realized that that was too fast and so we slowed things down um so don't be afraid to try something also on sunlight's website we do have assessments based on your child's age and levels as well so you can see for like language arts and math and those different subjects that are skill based kind of what is the point that they're at now and then build from there sunny that you you jogged my memory for one thing uh -huh. if you have on a level if you have 20 books that you're supposed to read aloud and your child has 15 books that they're supposed to read to themselves, right? That's 35 books that mm -hmm. are being read to them or they are reading. There is not a school. I don't think there's a traditional school in the country that your typical fourth grader is going to go through 35 books in a school year. So that being said, if you say, I can only do 10 read-alouds or 13 read-alouds and my child out of the, you know, the, whatever, the 20 books, they're going to read 10 because they're reading level. And we're going to, we're going to do every, if this book is scheduled for one week, we're going to take two weeks, right? Instead of reading 10 pages, we're going to read five. Do that. Look, there are books. I, I like Sunny. I'm an educated, college educated adult. There are several books in sunlight that I had never even heard of, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so, so we we have to get past that where we say, oh, if we don't do absolutely, we're gonna, yeah, you'll figure yeah. it out. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think Amber, what you've said a couple times, you know, like it's it sounds almost trite for us to say that, but yeah. the thing about parenting as a mom in general or a dad, you kind of know what your kids need or don't need, and you learn that. Yeah as time goes on. And I think homeschooling is is no different. Um, that way you learn what you need to do or maybe not do um, with each child. So we're running short on time, but I would mm -hmm. love to just very quickly throw out the lessons we've learned or mistakes we've made on a few topics um, so that we can kind of give that reassurance to people, even if they didn't ask exactly this question. And I know there were several that we did not get to um, that Sheila, Lisa, and Jonna have been answering in the chat. Um, if you are watching this after the recording, you know, please post your questions and comments again in the chat and we'll go back and answer those as well. Um, and somebody asked if they would be able to watch this again. Absolutely. We will post it back in our Sunlight app for you to watch as many times as you would like to. Um, but let's start with the planning too far ahead. I know we've touched on this a little bit. What lessons have you learned or what mistakes did you make and learn from when it came to planning too far ahead for your kids? There's too many factors to guess at. I like to think uh, two years big picture. What are we doing next year? Pencil in a plan and then know what we're doing this year. And if 50% of it turns out exactly like that, I'm a success. Yeah. Yeah. I think <laughs> with, with planning ahead, if you say, I know, you know, there are some things that change whether or not your child's college bound, right? So if, yeah. if your child's going into ninth grade and you know, they're college bound, you, you have to make some different decisions. If you have a child that wants to go into the military, you have to make different decisions starting in seventh grade. There are some things that you really need to put into place. So unless you have that kind of a situation, um, what Jen said, a year at a time, because um, I just had this conversation with someone, we can only control what's in front of our windshield. We can't see, you know, around the bend. Uh, a deer jumps in front of my car. That's what I'm worried about, right? <laughs> I, can't, I can't worry what's five miles down the road that I can't see. And so I think for me, that, that was, that's always been a hard thing. I future trip way too much. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
having a big general plan, yes, college bound or not, that dictates some things. Does my kid want to go to MIT? That changes things. Okay. Mm -hmm. As you hit high school, that changes things. But um, yeah, year at a time. Yeah. And I, I would say I have thoughts about what we're going to do next year. We're about halfway done with each mm -hmm. of my kids in their current year. But until I order my curriculum for next year, that even is not fully set in stone. So, you right. know, know when you plan to order. I like to order in the spring, so I'm ready to go. But I won't make final decisions until probably February. And then even from there, once the curriculum comes, until you start using it, sometimes I'll say, oh, I need to slow down for this child or this one's not enjoying this book, you know, things like that. So don't be afraid to pivot or make changes even within the year or, you know, the year leading up to that. Also, another mistake that I made was what worked for one child is going to work for the next child. You know, Amen. your kids have different personalities. And I have seen that, especially in the last couple of years, my kids are very, very different. And what worked for one child and what her interests were mm -hmm. at the same age are very different than my son. So be aware of that as well. Let's talk about that track towards independence. We talked about one thing at a time and making sure that you understand that your first or second grader is not gonna be as independent as an older kid. What lessons have you learned about moving your kids towards independence, keeping them accountable as they get older, those things? Yeah, I mean, I think that was probably my big thing that I, the point I made before. I made the mistake of thinking that, oh, what, what grade was that child in? Maybe ninth, uh, that when I sent them to do their math, they actually were. And at that time, Sunlight sold teaching textbooks. So that was what I had to do to keep my sanity. And I thought this particular child was doing their math. And um, I didn't check it constantly because it, you know, it's already checked. And so then when I, a couple months in, went to look, child was uh, not telling me the truth. And <laughs> we <laughs> had to do a lot. So I, I do, it was a good reminder to me that um, just because I'm a really cool mom doesn't mean that my kids aren't going to try to deceive me or that <laughs> that was a joke about being a really cool mom. Um, you know, I think you're cool. <laughs> accountability, account, accountability, probably as as they move toward independence and not expecting more than they actually can do, you know, putting that pressure that especially for that oldest, we all have to be uh, parents as multiples. You've got to be careful with that oldest not to make them an adult before yeah. they're an adult and it's hard the one i just learned relearned recently is i cannot make anybody do anything i can't make you do that reading or that math but i can make you want to so if you think that i am driving you to a theater this evening um i will be happy to do that as soon as you produce for me that math page corrected to my standards. So if, if you think you're going to youth group, but didn't do the math, then it will be a very sad evening for you at home. But I just kind of, you know, this is the expectation. And then when it's not done, I'm like, that's a bummer. Because yeah. I'm not gonna fight a teenager repeatedly about it. I'm just going to tell you exactly how it's going to go. And then that's how it's going to go. That is the lesson I keep relearning. Lucky for me, they keep relearning it too. But, um, <laughs> you know, you, you can't force it, but I can make you want to. I just can't make you do it. Yeah. And I think reinforcing there are consequences to the decisions we make, like you just said, yes. that, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sheila mentioned it in her video that homeschooling is character development in a lot yes. of ways. That's no. what kids are learning. That's what you're learning. Yeah. It's yeah. not. I was going to say it's character <laughs> development. Also, the kids learn stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So one more that I know I was so bad about was trying to do too much. I mentioned it at the beginning. I'm a type A perfectionist. I was that firstborn that did everything mm -hmm. ahead of schedule. And, and I thought everybody was like that. Um, and it's so funny. Once you have kids, you realize they're not. But you also realize that you put a lot 
on yourself. Um, and I think when you're trying to homeschool and be a good mom and be a good wife and, you know, be a good friend and a daughter and all those different things, sometimes you try to take on too much. Um, so that's something that I learned is what are my top two or three priorities? And let me make sure I'm doing those things really well. And then the rest of it, if it means that, you know, my husband's going to make dinner one night or we're going to do frozen pizzas because I don't have time to do that. Or, you know, you have to call before you show up because the house might be a mess. You know, those types of things. Um, I think you you learn what you can handle and what you can't. And for those of you that are tired and exhausted and feel like you're losing your mind, you're probably trying to do too much. Um, so look at the other people in your life that can help you or start cutting things back. Um, ladies, do you have any other advice? So that, that for me has always been my big one is, am I doing too much? When I start to fall apart, I'm doing too much. But is there any other thing that you've learned along the way that might help some other moms or dads out there um, or any other advice? Yeah. If you don't get to all of it, it's okay. It is 100% okay. I have graduated children. I have adult children. Um, and I have never thought to myself, oh, you know what? We really should have read that 35th book. The days we went to the beach, the days we went to the zoo, the movie nights, all of that stuff has been way more meaningful than the 35th book. So any day when you're like, we cannot even just don't. There will be enough days where you can do the math and do the writing and, and enough ways to get it all in that being perfect does not matter. Yeah, I think, um, wow, I remember being in this place of just sobbing, you know, on my bed, thinking about I'm responsible. And, and if you hear what I'm the saying to myself, it's probably not truthful. I'm responsible for their academics, for their emotional well-being, for their nutritional well-being, for their psychological well-being, for their social well-being. Truly, I went through this whole list. Like I'm responsible for all of it. Plus, I have to have a clean house. Plus, I have to have some kind of relationship with my husband. Plus, I have to look decent and dress, wear clothes and stuff. Um, I, I got I to gotta do all this and remember to brush my teeth. And I can't, I just can't, I can't do it all. And, you know, it's a lie. It's a lie that I'm responsible for all of that. I'm responsible for what is in front of me. And the, the Bible is very clear that as mothers, if you've been entrusted with children, you are to love them. You got to love your children. It, it says that you should take care of your home, right? That home should be a priority whatever that looks like home needs to be a priority somehow in your in your thinking so taking care of my home taking care of my children loving them um and i am not capable of doing even that without god's grace and help so it is not all on me um some of us have husbands who are very supportive and helpful and we need to lean into that and and have their help and have their reassurance and have their suggestions and be willing to listen to them. Like, even if they say to someone like Sunny, stop it, you're doing too much. She's okay. You're right. Right. And step back. Some of the moms watching today do not have supportive husbands or might not even have a husband at all and are trying to do this on their own. You're not on your own. God says he will be a husband to you and a father to your children and to lean in on him and um, and ask for his help and ask him to bring people in that can help you too. It is daunting and it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. That was great. <laughs> you guys both gave great closing remarks there. We are a little on time, over on time, so we will yeah. wrap it up. Um, but yeah, like Jonathan, for mothers of lots of people. <laughs> We, going over. 
We have so many things to say. Yeah. And we do want to pray for you and support you. So if you're struggling, tell us in the app or ask for that advice. Um, we're all in there and we, we do all care about what's going on in your homeschool as well. Um, we definitely don't do it 100% every single day. I think most days we would say we don't, um, but we make it work, you know, to the best of our ability and with God's help, like Amber said, yeah, lean into prayer and lean into your support as much as you can, even if that's, you know, getting in the app and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. We would love to, love to reassure you there. So if we did not get to your questions, please post those in the replay. We are going to drop this in the app for you later today or early tomorrow. So then you'll be able to ask questions there as well. And thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next month. Our next Helps and Hacks is going to be January 19th. And that one is called New Year Fresh Start. So if you're looking for a way to jump back in after the holidays or if you're starting a new year, we would love to help you out with that one. And as always, reach out to us in the app and on social media and we will be there. So Jen, Amber, thank you so much for joining me and speaking today. And then Jana, Sheila, and Lisa, thank you for fielding questions. I appreciate all of you.